that we recognize the gentleman from the Lone District of Pasig City, Representative Roman T. Romulo, be recognized to avail the privilege hour. Chairman Roman Romulo, the Lone, Lone District Representative of Pasig is hereby recognized. You have the floor, sir. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, Majority Leader, Speaker Ferdinand Martin G. Romualdez, my distinguished colleagues in the 19th Congress, Co-Chairperson of EDCOM 2, Congressman Mark Go, EDCOM 2 Commissioners, Congressman Kiko Benitez, Cali Dimaporo, PJ Garcia, Executive Director Carol Marquis, to the Advisory Council, and Secretariat of EDCOM 2 present here today, a pleasant afternoon to us all. Mr. Speaker, my honorable colleagues, allow me to update this August Chamber on the state of education in our country based on the year one report of EDCOM 2. In December 2019, the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development released the report from the 2018 cycle of the Program for International Student Assessment, or PISA, which the Philippines joined for the first time. Headlines at the time consistently highlighted a distressing reality. I quote, that among 79 participating countries, the Philippines ranks lowest in reading, math, and science. Close quotation. This raised alarms and ignited a collective acknowledgement of issues within our educational system. The subsequent, res subsequent response from Congress, which culminated in the passage of Republic Act Number no. 11899, marked the beginning of our collective endeavor to address the prevailing issues within our education system and ensure that our government provides the caliber of education that our children rightfully deserve. A year ago today, the Second Congressional Commission on Education convened to answer a pressing question. Is our country facing an education crisis? Beyond mere validation, our objective was to delve into the roots of this crisis and understand why it persists. Today, I stand before you to share the initial findings derived from a year spent unraveling the complexities of our educational landscape. These preliminary discoveries, focusing on 12 of our 28 priority areas, result from extensive data analysis and deliberations, 19 hearings, 12 focus group discussions, and 23 site visits across the nation. As we delve deeper, we anticipate a more profound understanding of the challenges at hand, which will, in turn, enable us to craft enduring solutions. Let us begin with early childhood. Studies show that the Philippines has one of the highest rates of under five stunting globally. And while our laws and programs adhere to global standards, implementation has become fragmented, coverage remains low, and targeting has been weak. Du during this critical period of cognitive development, lack of nourishment for both the mother and the child, especially in the first 1,000 days of life, carries consequences on the child's growth, learning trajectory, and overall life outcomes. On the matter of early childhood education, despite Republic Act 6972 of 1990, which requires each barangay to have at least one their care center, access to such facilities remains inequitable. A study by the Philippine Institute for Development Studies, PIDS, shows that only 36% of barangays have daycares or child development centers. The disparities are also stark 
In the first-class municipalities, there are up to six centers for every 10,000 children ages 3 to 4. However, in six-class municipalities, this number drops to only one to two centers for every 10,000 children. Adding to the complexities, another issue of concern arises in the qualification of entrusted of those entrusted with running these centers. The workers and teachers, by and large, lack the necessary training in early childhood education, ECE. Alarmingly, barely half of them have a college degree. 17% possess only a high school diploma, and a staggering few have received formal training in ECE based on trade data provided by the ECCD. Since 2005, the higher education institutions nationwide offering an ECE teaching pro program have only 3,993 graduates. This translates to less than 4,000 graduates in two decades, averaging barely 80 per year, a figure insufficient to meet the demands of our population. Compounding the issue is the employment status of the majority of these workers and teachers, holding non-permanent positions and receiving an average monthly wage of only 5,000 pesos. Worse, 19% of them, about one in five, receive only an honorarium of 1,000 pesos per month. While our basic education system boasts of a net enrollment rate close to 90%, the results of various international and national assessments underscore a disconcerting reality. Students are not learning effectively during their time in school. This disconnect between enrollment figures and the actual efficacy of learning within our educational institutions highlight the necessity of re-evaluating re our pedagogical approaches and education policies. With, respect, with, res with regards to textbooks and le learning module, we allocate over a billion pesos annually for textbook procurement on the belief that students benefit signi significantly from access to printed materials for both structured and self-directed learning. The review of EDCOM 2, however, reveals that over the past decade, the government has effectively procured merely 27 textbook titles for grades 1 to 10 students. Out of the 12.6 billion pesos allocated for textbooks from year from fiscal year 2018 to 2022, less than a billion pesos has been utilized. The challenges in procurement have also impeded our ability to assess and engage the learning outcomes of our students. On paper, despite the existence of numerous assessments, such as the National Achievement Test or not, designed to inform the, de the development and adjustment of any such interventions, in the basic education sector, EDCOM 2's analysis shows that out of the 27 key stage assessments scheduled from 2016 to 2023, 13 were administered late and 11 were not administered at all. This lapse in conducting assessments at designated times created a void in the system, system's level assessment data. Consequently, stakeholders have resorted to implementing additional tests, resulting in a proliferation of redundant assessments with varying quality, producing results that neither comparable nor, general, nor are generalizable at the national level, and ultimately placing an undue burden on teachers who sacrifice valuable instructions, instructional time to administer tests without obtaining meaning, meaningful and actionable results. 
in response to perceived learning lo- to the perceived learning loss during the lockdown during COVID-19, schools are on track to implement the National Learning Recovery Program. However, as revealed in consultations conducted by EDCOM2, interventions such as the learning caps during the school year breaks may not effectively reach the learners most in need of remediation due to costs associated with attending extra school days in school. It is crucial for us to strive to, make, to making learning equitable and to target support towards those who need it most. Higher education in our country exhibits a paradox. While enrollment numbers are on increasing, we are also seeing heightened dropout rates. Alarming data from the CHED indicate an attrition rate as high as 41% in 2020. Access to higher education also remains elusive for the economically disadvantaged. Despite budget allocations, inequities persist, and the intended beneficiaries of the subsidy program deviate from their original purpose. Enrollment figure among the poorest students have only seen a marginal improvement from 1.7% in 1999 to 6.1% in 2019, illustrating the depth of inequity in access. Most of those who have availed of the tertiary education subsidy lie outside the category of the poorest of the poor. Clearly deviating from the spirit behind the enactment of the universal access to quality tertiary education law. In 2018, listahanan beneficiaries in the subsidy program comprised 74% of enrollees. In 2022, this share dropped to 31%, with the majority of grantees hailing from the municipalities without SUCs and LUCs. In teacher education, disconcerting passing rates in the licensure examinations persist raising questions about the continued operation of the underperforming institutions. From 2009 to 2023, the average passing rate in the licensure examinations for elementary and secondary teachers has been dismal compared to those in other professions, at 33% and 40% respectively. EDCOM also found that between 2012 and 2022, 77 higher education institutions offering Bachelor of Elementary Education and 105 HEIs offering Bachelor of Secondary Education continue to operate despite having consistently zero passing rates in the licensure examination for teachers or let. Against this backdrop, the Strengthened Teacher Education Council remains unrealized. Two years after we work, we, after our work in passing this much-needed measure. Throughout our consultations across the nation, teachers consistently voiced a plea. Please help us, we just want to teach. However, as what many of us has been made aware their lamentation extends beyond issues in the classroom. And as additional responsibilities ranging from canteen management to filling up forms for the central office and even serving as coordinators for programs such as 4 Peace or DRRM. Over 50 tasks, according to the Department of Education's inventory, pull them out of the classrooms and away from their students. While efforts are being made to address this issue, such as hiring of new admin officers, which number at 5,000 per year starting in 2020, the reality is that these officers are often shared by multiple schools, thus making only a limited impact against the long list of ancillary and administrative tasks that we have been asked, that we have asked our teachers to take on. Some of these additional responsibilities date back as far as 1925, as reported in the Monroe survey. To compound teachers' frustrations, 
career advancement and professional development opportunities also remain limited. Turning our focus to tech voc education, we saw an increased participation enabled by the rise in Tibet institutions and the expanded subsidies and scholarships provided by the government. However, a majority of these enrollees, 3.7 million from, 2020, from 2014 to 2022, participated in community-based training programs. Unfortunately, these programs typically fall outside the purview of training regulations. And thus, do not lead to assessment and certifications, which are, in essence, the, the very proof of their acquired skill. In fact, of TESDA's 2,203 programs, only 315 or less than 15 percent lead to a national certification. This underscores a critical gap in aligning skills, acquisition with required standards, hindering the advancement of our large but mostly uncertified skilled workforce. An additional challenge also lies in the maze of policies governing enterprise-based training. With the existence of six distinct government policies and programs contributing confusion on the ground, this is all more concerning considering the majority of our skilling programs. 64% are designed for NC1 and NC2 levels, which le we yield only marginal improvements in income for our learners after completing the training. Industry participation remains limited and prohibitive, with numerous stakeholders expressing frustration over the voluminous paperwork, rigid but obsolete requirements, and prolonged processing times associate, associated with TESDA. The resounding message, Mr. Speaker, is unmistakable. We must invest in higher level qualifications that align with the dynamic demands of the labor market. This requires a transformation in bureaucratic systems, making them more agile and responsible, responsive to the rapidly changing needs of the industry. At the root of these profound challenges in governance, at the root of this are the profound challenges in government, governance and finance. We found that staffing le levels in education agencies have not kept pace with their growing responsibilities. For example, in 2013 to 2023, CHED's budget increased by 633%, but the agency staffing complement only marginally rose from 543 to 666 during this period, leaving the agency dependent on 752 contracts of service and job order personnel. Similarly, in the case of TESDA, the provincial offices grapple with a meager 7 to 12 personnel responsible for services, including a supervision of 17 to 80, 88 public and private technical vocational institutions. The first EDCOM envisioned the establishment of a National Coordinating Council for Education, a high-level coordinating body intended to for foster synergy among the DepEd, the CHED, the TESDA. Regrettably, this vision did not materialize. Instead, we find ourselves with 68 interagency bodies working on a broad range of concerns, leading to an impractical sit situation that results in misalignment at the system, agency, and individual levels. Despite substantial growth in education funding over the past decade, Sustaining increased investments, ensuring absorptive capacity, and strategically allocating resources, the genuinely support learning remain crucial challenges. This involves not just the quality of funding, but the effectiveness of its utilization. We must also see these issues at the school level, where, as what was discovered during consultations, principals, have lamented that their meager school maintenance and operating expenses are easily depleted by electricity bills. In some areas, 
consuming up to 70% of these funds. The challenges faced by our schools compound in misalignment at the system, agency, and individual levels. Despite substantial growth in education funding over the past decade, sustaining increased investments, ensuring absorptive capacity, and strategically allocating resources, the genuine support learning remain crucial challenges. This involves not just the quality of funding, but the effectiveness of its utilization. We must also see these issues at the school level, where, as what was discovered during consultations, principals have lamented that their meager school maintenance and operating expenses are easily depleted by electricity bills. In some areas, consuming up to 70% of these funds. The challenges faced by our schools, compounded by the inequities in the Special Education Fund, the medium, the median SEF income of municipalities stands at 1.6 million pesos, which is roughly equivalent to 4% of the median SEF income of cities and provinces. This contra the contrast bears fur further between first income class municipalities, which have 68 times more SEF compared to their sixth income class peers. The SEF burdened with a growing list of expenditures, including nutrition and early childhood education. It therefore becomes incumbent upon us to revisit this policy to ensure equitable resourcing so that no child is left behind. Mr. Speaker, dear colleagues, the Commission's findings highlight the prevailing situation of the Philippine education system as it falls short of several standards. For one, a system is defined as a regular interacting or interdependent group of items forming a unified whole. By this standard, the education system in the Philippines struggles to meet the criteria of a true system. Moreover, it has fallen short of fulfilling the constitutional mandate of providing a complete, adequate, and integrated system of education. Instead of working as an interconnected system, the various agencies, bureaus, and offices have all often devoted their, their solely on their respective mandates and targets, operating independently of one another. This is evident in the findings uncovered by the Commission in its first year. Ultimately, this fragmentation has led to the miseducation or poorly delivered education of Filipino learners bringing about a profound education crisis as has been laid bare by both national and international assessments, issues that the Commission is committed to squarely addressing. The headlines we've shared offer a glimpse into the comprehensive findings within the 400-plus pages of EDCOM, EDCOM 2's inaugural year report. Within those pages lies a thorough and measured examination of the challenges permeating our schools from their context and roots to the potential pathways forward. While these ways forward seem difficult to parse from, a sheer, from the sheer volume of findings and the task at hand may appear daunting, the imperative, however, is clear. It is incumbent upon us to shift from, a, from piecemeal reform towards a strategic and united approach that aspires to not merely seeking short-term solutions to the challenges we have uncovered, but to ultimately build a robust and genuine education system. Such a shift requires moving away from a mindset that is narrowly focused on our own individual targets to one that recognizes the interdependence of our work from plans that are perfect on paper to those that are doable in practice. The foundational step towards Solutions involves a meticulous examination of the problem and determining the precise obstacles that impede genuine reform. A task that the Commission diligently pursued in our year one report. This is the role of EDCOM True, translating this, this clarity into actionable points so that together we can work towards a nation where every learner has access to quality education. As we embark on the remaining two years of EDCOM 2, our resolve is even stronger. 
This year, we will examine the remaining 16 priorities addressing concerns from early childhood to higher education, including issues such as shortage in classrooms, bullying, and research productivity. Nevertheless, we are mindful that our ultimate goal ex extends beyond resolving issues that are symptoms of underlying problems. It is about the need to build and future-proof our system of education, one that is not only responsive to the needs of the present day, but also capable of evolving to meet the needs of the future. We carry forward the momentum gained in our first year, a momentum fueled not just by the tireless work of our advisory council and standing committee members and our colleagues in Congress, but also by the unwavering solidarity and sense of duty of individuals profoundly passionate about Philippine education. This collective commitment encompasses teachers, parents, our partners in DepEd, CHED, and TESDA, as well as advocates and stakeholders at every level who remain steadfast in their dedication to do their part for the betterment of our country and our learners. Congratulations to EDCOM2 and to each and every individual who has contributed to the progress that we have achieved at this point. However, our work is far from over. Let us leverage this momentum and continue to move forward together in the remaining two years of EDCOM2 for a brighter future for, the Fili for Philippine education and the Filipino people. Consistent and in accordance with RA number 11899, EDCOM 2 will be submitting to this August chamber to the Speaker of the House its year one report on, the, on those levels, on those skills, on those uh, spheres that the uh, EDCOM 2 have already this, uh, that I have disclosed in this report and that we have heard upon. I urge all the members of this August Chamber to read the 400-page report. This 400-page 400 400 report is a roadmap already for those basic foundational things that we must do. Again, this is the year one report. There is still two years to go for EDCOM 2. But just in year one, we have seen that there are many foundational problems that we must already address. So with the operation and with the patience of all the members, hopefully together, united, we push for these reforms, for a better future, for a better Philipp Philippines, for a future of our Filipino learners. Maraming salamat, Speaker. Maraming salamat, distinguished colleagues. Majority Leader.